For the lights, we would be extremely <laughs> grateful. All right, so we're going to continue on since we've done the nervous system already. Right, we're going to continue on with the nervous system. It's only it's only 16 slides, so we'll get through this today. All right. So this is motor control. Okay. Now that we know a little bit about the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, you have these motor command centers. So in the cerebral cortex, right, those parts of the brain that I said you don't really need to know, because you know, I'm not going to ask you about the location, bless you. But that's the, the higher centers of command. In addition to that, you also have your forebrain, right? The frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex is what makes you human. That's a control center because that's what decides if the motor control centers are activated or deactivated, right? The fact that I'm doing this is because of this part of my brain is sending a message to my motor cortex saying, send a signal to move his hands up and down right now, go side to side, okay? So that's what these higher centers are, those parts of the brain that make you human. You don't need them to move, right? But you, you can decide. You don't need them. Then you have the sensory motor cortex. Again, it's part of these, it's, it's right near the middle of your brain. So if you were to take me and split me open, right about here, at this part of my head, if I drill the hole and went straight through, that's where my sensory motor cortex is located. Right there on the top. Okay? Um, then you have these basal nuclei. And these basal nuclei, again, you can look back at it. They're in there. They're these big nuclei that are part of the, not part of the cortex, but part of the medulla of the brain. Um, and then you have the thalamus. The thalamus is a relay station in your brain. It goes from your cortex to your um, brain stem. Okay, it's a relay center. And then you have your brain stem, okay, the cerebellum, which is involved in motor coordination and movement. And then, of course, you have your brain stem and spinal cord. So, afferents, receptors, like in my fingers, are sending information backwards in the system. And then, efferents are sending information in this direction. So, motor control hierarchy. Everything that's in green is the highest level. Prefrontal cortex, all right, uh, somatic um, motor area. And then you have middle levels, the sensory cortex, the basal nuclei, this is sort of the middle bed. And then local control, your brain stem and spinal cord. Remember, these are where these motor neurons originate from, from these two areas. Motor neurons do not originate from this area. So something to keep in mind, you should have a good idea about these connections. Even if you don't know what the parts look like, you can look them up and what they do. But I want you to know how this is all interconnected. And it's complicated, right? Physiology is complicated. When you ask me a question, when anybody asks me a question about physiology, the answer usually starts with, it sort of depends. Always, it sort of depends. It's not as simple as, the neuromuscular junction only releases acetylcholine. That's easy to know. Most of the time, it's the sort of the mess. Okay. So, this is a side and cross-sectional area of some of these spots. Again, so if you haven't taken anatomy in a while, um, you can sort of remind yourself. So, you can see these sensory motor cortex, again, right about here. The prefrontal cortex is here. Here's the frontal cortex. And that's what makes you human. Here's the the brain stem, okay, and here and this is the cerebellum, this is part of the spinal cord. If you do a frontal section here, okay, you can see that on the outside of the brain, this is the cortex, and this is where all of the high level stuff happens. As you get in here, right, you get, you have just axons. So the, the cell bodies of the neurons all live here, those nuclei, most of them live here. So that's why damage to the outer portion of your brain is probably the worst thing you can have happen because that's where all the cell bodies are that help you do you and do you. 
these are the basal nuclei, there are also cell bodies. <coughs> and then this is the thalamus. And the thalamus is associated with the hypothalamus and the epithalamus. Again, I'm not going to ask you about them. We will get to the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus is the connection between the central nervous system and the endocrine system. Something called the HPA axis, which we're going to get to when we get to the, nerve, uh, the endocrine system. Okay, so you should sort of look this over, re-familiarize and familiarize yourself with these areas. And so, um, it talks about here Parkinson's disease and substantia nigra, but we're not going to focus on that. Alright, so again, this is for you, it's an explanation that goes along with this. So that you can read through it and say, okay, functions, you can read the highest level, middle level, and low level on your own. Here's another one of these diagrams. So, examples of categories of information modifying the production of motor commands. So, this is associated with this, okay? So, you have these excitatory and inhibitory local inner neurons. So, you constantly have a barrage of information coming in, both your eyes, your ears, right? All kinds of information. What your balance receptors tell you, your inner ear is highly involved in balance and coordination. It's part of your what's called your vestibular system and your cerebellum. All of that gets funneled into these inner neurons. It's a decision making center. And then these neurons have to decide what happens. Some of that information is inhibitory, like we were looking at those creative potentials with GABA. Some of those pieces of information are excitatory, like glutamine. So the excitatory signals release things like glutamate or epinephrine or norepinephrine, and the inhibitory side will release glycine or GABA, okay, or other inhibitory. And then ultimately, here's here's the muscle, right? So here's my muscle right now. My bicep is curling, right? Because coming all the way from my forebrain here, from my frontal cortex into my sensory somatosensory cortex down to my brain stem, down to my spinal cord, my cerebellum is involved in the coordination, I then can do this at the motor level. So in the most simple, in the most simple diagram, right, these don't exist and these don't exist. In the brain, in the area of the brain that controls motor control, right, which is basically here. Okay? There are pattern generators. Okay, what the heck is a pattern generator? Meaning that there's a constant barrage of information coming from that part of your brain to your muscles all the time. They're constantly receiving information, even if you're not moving. Part of it is postural, right? When you're, you're sitting there right now, you're not doing much, even if you're writing, right? But you still are upright to some degree, right? That means that there have to be signals that are going to those muscles that keep you upright. There's a pattern of information. Now, you can change that pattern, right? You have the ability on this part of your nervous system, the somatic, somatic nervous system, to change that activity. Right? Because you could decide right now that you don't want any part of this and get up and walk out. You have full control of that. So there's a pattern of information that's constantly going through. You can think about the pattern as a tonic activity that keeps your nervous system and all the connections nourished. As a use it or lose it type effect. If you don't have these pattern circuits on all the time, that they're sending information down the stream, then when you need them, you can't use them because they forgot. So it's, there's a learning effect here, and it has that information has to keep flowing at a very, very low level. Think about something you haven't done in a really long time. Okay? Something you haven't done in a really long time. And then when you go to do that for the first time in a very long time, are you as good as you used to be? No. Can you do it? 
probably there's a, there's a memory involved. The best example would be riding a bicycle. If you haven't ridden a bicycle in 30 years, I'm pretty sure the minute you get on a bicycle, you might wobble a little bit, but within a few seconds, you will be able to ride that bicycle. So there's a there's a memory too, but there are other other circuits that aren't as good as that. So some things are much more complicated, and so it, it would take you longer to remember that. Your body does this; it knows that there are certain really really important patterns that you do or need to do as a human being, and so that information has to constantly get sent. And if you don't, you forget, just like anything else. Does that make sense? You can forget how to do things. Um, and all of this information comes in and gets translated into, ultimately it gets translated into active potentials and neurotransmitters. And depending on the combinations that you put together, they'll either be excitatory, on the motor neuron, or inhibitory. This is what we were just talking about before, this plus and this minus, right? And then that will either cause this to have an active potential occur, and move or not. Now, it's more complicated because your joints have receptors, right? And so whatever's going on in your joint when you move will determine how you move. So for instance, if you have arthritis, which is something that happens at a joint, and every time you move it, there's pain, will that not affect the quality of a muscle contraction? Sure, watch people move around that have arthritis, right? Rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. It doesn't matter what caused it. Do they move the same as you? They do not. So does that receptor have an effect? If you could shut that receptor off, would they actually, theoretically, would they move better? Yeah, they would be in pain. I mean, they may still do damage. That's not what we're saying here. But would they be able to move? What's causing them not to move well? They hurt. Right? If you get rid of that receptor, if you somehow shut it down, they won't hurt anymore, they'll move better, assuming that they haven't torn the joint to pieces so that it's not functional anymore. Right? Eventually they will, and eventually even that will help. But that's how you have to think about this. The tendons, we're going to talk about at the tendons. There's, there's a mechanism within the tendon, within the muscle, there are two of them. The, the one's called the Golgi apparatus, the other one's called the um, the, the, the muscle spindles, okay? And they sense pressure and force, right? So what's going on here makes a difference. Then you have muscle receptors. You also have skin receptors. What's going on in your skin? Other spinal levels and descending pathways. All of this gets incorporated into movement. It's really complicated, right? It is. It's supposed to be. You're very, very complicated as, as a species. We are very complicated. We do very complicated things, right? So this is something you need to sort of put in your wheelhouse as things that can affect movement, right? So this is another thing that you sort of got to say, I, I need to know this stuff because this is the kind of stuff that can affect my movement. Questions? All right, so you have a muscle, a set of muscle fibers. All right, so here you have, this is called the Golgi tendon organ. All right, and these are afferents, meaning what? When I say afferents, what do I mean? Simple definition, afferent. When I say afferent in this class, that means what? To the brain, that's right. So this information from the tendon here Remember, the tendon is the connection between a muscle and a bone. And this information from the inside here, this is called a muscle spindle, is all going back to your brain. <coughs> now, not necessarily the central nervous system, but it's going to a different part of the nervous system, right? But it's heading in that direction. That's the important part. Okay. So I'll just read this because this is actually something very, very new. Acting on local reflex circuits and by relaying impulses to the brain, the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs provide information about muscle position and stretch in order to finally regulate speed and intensity of contraction. How can you play with this? Let me give you an example. When 
these, these two, one measures the amount of force that you're producing, all right? The other measures the stretch. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you first start doing an activity, right, can you produce a lot of force in that activity? It sort of depends, right? It depends on how strong you already are. But it, are you producing as much force as you possibly can compared to what you, you're capable of? Probably not. Okay? And the other thing that happens is when you do an activity is there may be stretching going on. Okay? So when you first do an activity and your muscle or set of muscles is stretched beyond what you have normally experienced, your body will interpret that as danger. All right, and will prevent that from occurring. So it won't, won't let you do it. Okay, it'll lock up on you. So as you're overstretching, what would be the opposite of the stretching? What would the body tend to do? So let's say you're not very you're not very flexible. Although that's not really the term you should be using, but we'll just use it because that's what you do. If you're not very flexible and you're trying to do the splits. You want to learn how to do splits for whatever reason, right? You're going to try to take, especially guys, right? And for anatomical reasons, we understand why this is more challenging, right? Does anybody disagree with us that there's anatomical differences? Okay. So you're going to try, you decided, you took a bet from a fraternity brother, and you, you got to be able to do the splits by the end of the semester. Or else you're buying the first round. Okay, so you're gonna win this if you don't want you don't want to get a job. You gotta win this bet if you want to. Okay. What do you think is gonna happen as you start to move your legs in the position of doing the splits? So that's a stretch. What is the body's response to this? Go ahead. Muscle contraction. Muscle You're gonna fight it. Your body will fight this. It doesn't want to have it because it's scared. Physically when you do it. You don't move that way. Not you. Not ever. Why now? Okay, maybe when you were three, it would, it would work well, but not now. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. The same thing with force production, right? The same thing with force production. When you encounter a load, whatever that load may be that you've never encountered before, one of the reasons why your, your body will protect you is because when you produce an inordinate amount of force, it's afraid you're going to tear something. Same thing with the stretch, right? You're going to tear something. But the force is, is the opposite of the stretch. So, what is, so let's, let's give you the example. And I've seen this many times in my life. Go to the gym, a bunch of guys, lots of hormones going on. It's bicep day, it's arm day in the gym. And you know, there's varying degrees of strength prowess in this group of gentlemen. And the weakest guy in the group is deciding that he's going to show up the strongest guy in the group. And so whatever the strongest guy is curling, the weakest guy is going to try because this is what guys do. Why not? Sounds like a great idea. Right? Right? So he, he takes the weight off of the rack, and he's in a power rack. Don't ever curl in a power rack. It says all kinds of bad things about you. All right, but you're in, you're in a power rack, right? Victoria says lots of bad things about you. And he's gonna try, right? And he's grunting and moving and body shaking and all kinds of stuff, and his friends are laughing at him because they know he can't do it. Right? But physiologically, what's happening with the, these receptors in the muscle? He's trying to produce a lot of force, right? Is he active? He's trying to produce a lot of force. But his brain, which is a lot smarter than he is, at least this portion of the brain, is saying, this doofus is going to tear something here. Right? Because he is. Unless we do what? And so he tries and tries and tries. If you've ever seen this before in any type of physical activity where you're giving it your all, and then what happens? Just it's almost instantaneously. It comes down. What happened? Did he give up? Maybe. I have an alternative hypothesis. What 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 happened based on this? He's producing more force than his body's used to see in this area. Doesn't like it. Doesn't like it one bit. And all of a sudden, doom, what happened nervous system wise? What do you think happened? That's right. He got shut down. 
The system said, oh no, negative, boom. Sent a negative signal, said you gotta shut this sucker down. He doesn't even realize how stupid he is. So I'm gonna realize it for him. And, and it's just a drop, it's almost immediate. So both of those systems do the exact opposite but for the exact same reason. They're trying to protect the muscle from tearing itself. Now, with time, okay, let's go back to the example of the guy doing stretch. He's not going to try to overstretch, right? With time, he's just going to get to right to the point where it sort of feels uncomfortable, right? And he does this a couple times a day, every day. What's his system? And he never hurts himself, right? He never, he never cannot walk, right? What is his physiology? What is the system, these muscles and these receptors? What are they going to start to think? They're not really thinking. Right? They'll sort of pretend like they're going to them play like people. Over time, you're doing this and you're not hurting yourself and you're stretching, and now the body realizes, oh, he's not going to hurt himself. What is it going to allow this person to now do? A little bit at a time. Yeah? Stretch. To stretch a little bit more. That's why when you start stretching, you never want to push to the outer limits, right, early on, because the body's response to that is contraction. But if over time you do a little bit, a little bit, and a little bit, then it will say, oh, this is safe. I don't have to protect it. It's okay. Same thing with the other thing. Instead of taking the, you know, the amount that he can't lift, Right, but he starts with the, the bicep curl, starts with something he can, and pushes just a little beyond, maybe the last rep each time. He's just about. What is then that muscle going to say? Imagine that these are people having a conversation that they work together, right? That there's a group of them deciding, do we let this do this or not? Maybe yes, maybe no. What's going to happen physiologically over time? You're going to get stronger because what, what is decreasing? Go back to what is decreasing? This? That's why when someone first starts to do an activity, especially if it's strength or power related, You've got these two factors working against you. Some of the initial gains that you make are all central nervous system. Even before you see changes in muscle size, right? Because the nervous system knows that this is dangerous and you have to convince it in a way to, 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 to decrease some of the inhibition here, but also to decrease some of the excitation on the other side, right? So that's what these two things have. You have to desensitize the Golgi tendon organ and the muscle spindles. If you don't, you're going to fight your own physiology. And that's why when you push too hard too soon, this is when people get hurt, and this is when people get discouraged because they're fighting their own physiology. That's why it's not a good way to do it, right? Hopefully that's an example or a set of examples that resonates with you. It's like, oh, that sort of makes sense, right? I've seen that before. I've tried that before. Help you remember these these two parts of the muscle here, which are they're sensors, right? They're trying to protect you from yourself. Okay. Questions? Okay, so let's let's take a look at examples here. So regardless of the reason for a change in length, the stretch spindle in the scenario A generates a burst of action potentials as the muscle is lengthened. In scenario B, the shortened spindle produces fewer action potentials. Right? So you have a ball in your hand. This is the, the spindle. Right? So this sits inside of, we're going to talk about gamma and alpha motor neurons. Right? These on the outside here are the actual muscle fibers that contract. These muscle fibers are specialized and have been turned into sensors. They used to look like this, now they look like this. Right? So they don't actually contract. So as this in scenario A gets stretched, right, what starts to happen? Well, the muscle spindles actually increase in the number of action potentials. They're saying, whoa, you're stretching this thing, right? In scenario B, you've already contracted. Right? And then as you get closer to full contraction of the muscle, what starts to happen to the number of action potentials? It decreases because 
The stretch receptors say it's fine. You're not overstretching it. We don't need to worry about it. He's in contraction. We don't do contraction. We do stretch. So we don't have to worry. Okay? So this is something called, in scenario C, it's something called alpha-gamma coactivation. Okay? Alpha-gamma coactivation. Alpha motor neurons are the ones that contract. Gamma motor neurons are the action potentials uh, generating sensors in the middle. So these are the these are the gammas, these are the alphas. Okay? And you co-activate them. Right? You co-activate them. And when you co-activate them, meaning you're doing both of these at the same time, that the weight is heavy enough to produce a stretch and you're in the more contracting position. These are firing, and these are firing, and this is what happens to the active potential train. It looks something like that. So this is the fiber. So these are the neural connections to all of this, right? So here's an example. We're going to use the knee-jerk reflex as a reflex, just because it's one that everybody's aware of. Everybody's probably had it done to them, so you can relate to this. Tapping the patellar tendon lengthens the stretch receptor in an associated extensor muscle. In this case, the extensor muscle is probably one of the quads, right? One of them. Vastus medialis, vastus lateralis. Um, okay. So, what ends up happening? So, this muscle here, the stretch receptors, the spindles, sense that it's being lengthened. They send a signal back. What is this thing? What is this structure? It's called a ganglion, right? And this is a dorsal ganglion, which means that this is sensory, it's afferent. It goes through the spinal nerve, through the dorsal ganglion, all right, into the back. So on the dorsal side, it's coming in from this side of my spinal cord, all right? And it goes in here, and then it synapses with these, it synapses a couple of ways. This is an inner neuron, is the red one. And then it synapses immediately with these green ones, which are motor neurons. Okay. So this is a reflex. So what ends up happening is it immediately synapses, causes these to release excitatory neurotransmitter, right, and decrease the inhibitory, and that will send this to threshold to cause an action potential, and you get. Have you thought about it? No. Have you had anything to do with it other than being alive? No. This is what a reflex does, right? It's not the same as I decide I want to move my leg out here. That's coming from here, the origination. And this is designed to protect you, right? This type of motor pathway is designed because by the time you figure out what has happened, right, in the real world that we used to live in, look back 10,000 years, Paleolithic era, right? Things were dangerous, and you had to be able to respond. Have you seen the new commercial? I think it's a Passat, or a Volkswagen. It's a Volkswagen, for sure, with the father and his daughter. Anyway, if you see it on TV, your father and daughter are talking. The dad's taking his daughter to school. He's like, you don't want me to, you know, right? And she's like, no, no, it's not that, dad. You don't want your friends to see me. And he's having this conversation, right? He's going to high school, wherever he's going. And as he's having this conversation, some crazy kid, shocking as this may be, pulls off in front of him, and he doesn't see it. But what ends up happening with that car? What's it do? It stops. It's got a system built. It's got a reflex built into it, right? That's what it has. This is what you have built into you. It's a reflex, right? So be, before the dad even knows what's happening, that, that Volkswagen has applied the brakes and saves him from rear ending this probably 16 or 17 year old kid who just decides to pull up in front of somebody and they don't get into an accident, right? That's what the reflex is supposed to do. That's what reflexes do for you. By the time you figure out what's happened, you've already responded to it. If you know martial arts, or you know someone that's a martial artist and has been trained to fight, the worst thing you could do is sneak up on this person, because they will take you down. It's a reflex, right? They will take you down, because by the time they figured out what they're doing, you're on the ground, 
and they're and they're sitting over there like this, ready to punch your brains out, right? Because that's the way they train, and they actually turn this action into a reflex. And so you don't want to sneak up on someone who knows how to do this because it's very very dangerous, right? Now the good news is they they know how to do things called focus, and so they don't necessarily hit you right away, but they'll take you down, right? They will, and that's because of this. You have a lot of these systems built in to protect you. By the time you figure out what's happened, it's already happened that you need to be running, usually. Does that make sense? So this is a pathway. So you have an afferent neuron that directly synapses with a motor neuron. But it also synapses with this here. Could you potentially block a reflex? If you learned how to do it, you could. And that's because of this. This inner neuron is stuck in there. You have the ability to learn this, but it's practice, right? So I'm a martial artist. I don't want to kill somebody, so I have practice control. I could sort of go around. But if you're in the military and your job is killing people, or at least not dying, then this, this would not be a good idea, right? So that would be the worst person to sneak up on and try to play a joke on, especially if they own guns and they carry them all. You see how this starts to become problematic? Ooh, all kinds of great things with this yellow thing. <laughs> all right. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Golgi tendon organ. We're just going to show you examples, right? So the Golgi tendon organ, so activation of the Golgi tendon organs compared to when a muscle is contracting, passive stretch of relaxed muscles produces less stretch on the tendon and fewer action potentials. So, the Golgi tendon organ is located at the tendon. That's why it's called the Golgi tendon organ, right? And so it's in a relaxed state here. You have a passive stretch. Notice, notice that you get a little bit of firing. But what happens when you contract that muscle? You get more firing or less? Here. More. Okay. So of these two, which one is the sensor for the amount of force being produced? The Golgi tendon or the muscle spindle? And which one is the stretch, mainly the stretch receptor? Tell me, which one is which? Based on what you've seen. Because I've sort of been vague, haven't I? I'm going to be sort of grouping them together on purpose. Which one is the force production sensor? This one or the other one? Which one is when you're producing that guy that was, you know, had a bet with his friends and he's trying to curl that weight that he couldn't do? Which one of those, of these two sensors, is the one that ended up getting shut down? Shut down the muscles so that you couldn't do it anymore? Was it this one or was it the spindle? This one you stretch it and you get a little bit of fire. But when you contract it, well, you get more fire. It's a Mercer set, right? So, which one is the force production sensor? Because this is what's being sensed. Which one is the force production sensor? The force production sensor, by definition, would fire more the more you produce force. The stretch receptor would fire more as you stretch it. This is what happens with this one, the muscle spindle during contraction. This is what happens when you stretch it. This is what happens when you stretch this one. This is what happens when you contract. So which one is the force production sensor? This one or the other one? Okay. This one. This is the Golgi tendon organ is the one that when you, you're producing too much force, it's going to send an inhibitory signal to your alpha motor neurons and to, so that you can shut down force production. The other one is the stretch receptor. When you overstretch, this is the one that's going to send an, an excitatory signal to the alpha motor neurons to contract. And this is the one that you're trying to, so you're trying to desensitize this in the, figure out how to do a full split. You're trying to desensitize the spindle 
And here, as you're trying to get stronger to move more weight, you're trying to desensitize the Golden tendon. Okay, so we did this. Um, uh, this is just talking about neural pain components, so it's all. So this is just an example of how you would use this um, this reflex. In this case, you stepped on a nail, and a nociceptor is a pain receptor. And what would happen, right? You could get a reflex out of this too. So it just uses this pain withdrawal reflex, and just shows you the pathway. Is the pain withdrawal reflex a little bit more complicated than the knee jerk reflex? It is. It is, because there's a lot more stuff going on here. It doesn't just synapse with a motor neuron, right? It synapses with some motor neurons, but then there's a bunch of inner neurons in between. So this one isn't as cut and dry. So what you need to know is that the pain pathway is more complicated than the knee jerk reflex. At the very least, Um, these are the parts of the brain um, you should know that are part that are involved in somatic um, movement. So you have here you have the supplementary motor cortex, the premotor cortex, the primary motor cortex, somatosensory, and parietal. So you should know those names just because they're associated. This is called a homunculus. Don't worry about this. Cross this off. Forget about this slide. Told my students the same thing last semester. So in this class, you don't even have to know what a is. If you want to know what a homunculus is, ask me later. Okay. All right. Um, motor commands. So, so efferent motor commands. So this is, remember, the cortex is the outer portion of any organ. This is where the, the cell bodies are for these complicated areas that are part of the somatic area that's involved in motor control. So remember, the somatic nervous system is involved in controlling the skeletal muscle. So a signal gener is generated from the primary somatic, um, somatic area. It travels down through, passes by basal nuclei, goes into the brain stem, usually crosses over. So you see something called crossover here. And what started off on the right side here ends up on the left side. So the nervous system does this a lot with these types of tracks, is that you get this crossover. So if something starts on this side, you get the opposite occurring. You get this crossover so that you're left. So this is how, if you have an odor of damage and your brain is involved, if you have that damage on the right side of your brain, you're gonna see deficits on the left and vice versa. So a neurologist knows these things, right? It depends on the area, though. Not every track crosses over. And so, that's why you have to remember this with the normal, right? It's not every one of these that simple. But in its simplest form, these cross over. And then they go to the skeletal muscle, right? It's going out from here. This is the ventral side, right? It's bypassing this ganglia here, because this ganglia is what kind of ganglia? Why isn't this, why isn't this going through this ganglia? It's an afferent ganglia. The only information coming back will go through that ganglia, not something. Um, motor activity must be informed. So you have a sense, and you can do this, right? And you can train this. Most of you are not trained very well, but you can do this. And so if you close your eyes, standing is easy, right? Standing with your eyes closed, eh, you're probably fine. But standing you know, on one leg, becomes a little bit more challenging, and then now standing on one leg and your eyes closed becomes even more challenging, you have your arms out, right? So your body, your brain, knows your position in space, right? So something that you've been doing all of your life, for instance, like walking down the steps. In the United States, most places, everything is very systematic, the way we build things, right? So the distance between one step and the next is the same. So you probably could, for the most part, walk down a flight of stairs, assuming everything else is good and normal, and you have some people to protect you, and do it with your eyes closed. If you try to do the same thing in Nicaragua, you have a big problem, because nothing is standardized there, right? So your body knows its position in space, and because of that, a lot of what you do 
doesn't really involve your eyes and you don't realize it until you don't use them and say, oh, that's really cool. Like, I don't need my eyes to do this. All right, so that's it. Motor control, now we, then we'll start on muscle. <coughs> Questions? Yes, they're, they're foot flop. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. I stopped doing it for a while and I'm bringing it back. So, three most important things we did today that we talked about. Pain receptors are more complicated. Yes, pain receptors. Look at the difference. Much more important, much more complicated than knee jerk. What else? Yeah. Know the difference. They're not the same, right? Do, can they, are, is there some overlap? Yes, there is some overlap, but which one is primarily stretch and which one is primarily force production? But there's definitely overlap, because if you didn't have overlap, you wouldn't get signals when you stretch the load receptor and when you loaded up the stretch receptor. One more. One more. Come on. Help me out here. Yeah, that whole system. This is what you're striving to, more complicated. As soon as I get the question, we will forward it to you. All right? I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a great day.